His nature has long been in debate for a variety of reasons, or maybe from a variety of different approaches. You could say that question is one in debate. But maybe it would boil down to something along the lines of, are we good or evil by nature? Is man generally good and we only become corrupted through exposure to the world? Or are we generally evil and we can only sort of ascend out of that through the exertion of some extraordinary force? In the Christian world, the question, the debate is more specifically rooted in the idea or the concept of so-called original sin. Am I, by very nature of being born, an heir of Adam's sin and would only be able to escape that at some indeterminate point afterward? When is man guilty? When are we responsible? For instance, to clarify this position that man would be born in sin, let's take a look at the doctrine in their own words, so to speak, this is a representative example from the Westminster Confession of Faith. This is a 17th century uh, sort of foundational reform doctrine. It says, by this sin, the eating of the forbidden fruit, they're referring to Adam and Eve, they, our first parents, fell from their original righteousness and communion with God and so became dead in sin and wholly defiled in all the faculties and parts of soul and body. They, being the root of all mankind, the guilt of this sin was imputed, and the same death and sin and corrupted nature conveyed to all their posterity, descending from them by ordinary generation. From this original corruption, whereby we are utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all good, and wholly inclined to all evil, do proceed all actual transgressions. What we're dealing with when that, that doctrine is taught or is thought of would be the idea of total depravity. You might have heard that phrase, or total hereditary depravity, total inability, original sin, radical corruption, I think is maybe kind of a newer term for this idea. In summary, that is stating what we just read and what we are talking about is stating the idea that man is supposedly born in a completely spiritually dead state. He is born completely guilty in sin and has no ability of his own means to save himself or to do the things necessary to accept salvation from God. And the root cause of this penetrating and total deadness is said to be Adam's sin in the garden. Well, our question anytime we would come together to investigate such a doctrine is not to uh, just poke holes, not to just sort of throw fire at some other group that is not meeting here. Rather, our question is always going to be simply, is it biblical? Is there foundation for this idea that man is born in sin, that Adam's sin would be inherited? And that's what I want to give our time our attention to this morning. I hope it will be a profitable study for you. This idea that we've begun with, that we've begun looking at, this doctrine of, of total depravity, of original sin, it's very prevalent in the world today. I, I don't think I'm giving a, a spoiler by saying I do not believe it is biblically accurate. I do think it is erroneous, but it is worthy of our investigation. It is worthy of looking into to discern not just, I think it's wrong, so it's wrong. What has God said on the matter? And will that prove things to be right or wrong? I hope it will be useful offered in that spirit and that we might be able to gain from our study together today. Thank you all very much for being here. We are certainly glad that you're with us and hope that the time has been edifying, that you will walk away from here. Glad you have come to the house where God is worshipped. And that is certainly our aim in all things. Let's begin with a few early questions, just sort of ideas that this, this sentiment, this thought itself brings up from the start. Paul writes, for instance, in his letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13, he mentions the idea that evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, 
deceiving and being deceived. You'll find that idea several places in Scripture, actually. A few other passages seem to indicate that man can fall further and further into an abyss of wickedness. But if, as this doctrine in question states, every man is wholly inclined to all evil and wholly defiled upon birth, how can you begin wholly defiled and from that point grow worse? What, what other bottom would you be able to reach than completely averse to all things good by very nature? How would we possibly grow worse and worse? It's very clear, secondly, that some men are more wicked than others. Look no further than the two first offspring of Adam himself, Cain and Abel. If both were inherently utterly disposed towards complete wickedness, how did those two men end up behaving so very differently? Abel acted through faith and Cain ended up murdering him. If men are totally depraved from the moment of their birth, why are some more wicked than others? A third question. We can observe that not every person, even among non-believers, not every person is involved only in working evil. How would the unsaved be capable of doing good if they are born wholly defiled in all faculties and parts of soul and body, as that confession of faith read? How would you, how would you be capable of doing anything that has some semblance of the nature of God within it, which we see men are quite capable of? even on their own. Why would we sin in different ways? An apple produces an apple tree. An apple seed, I guess, produces an apple tree. And the tree produces apples. And those apples produce seeds. And that just begets the entire cycle. Type gives birth to type. We should expect that if Adam's nature was passed on to each individual, wouldn't it be manifested in much the same way? But people struggle with sins that Adam, so far as we have any knowledge, had no problem with at all, and vice versa. If Adam's sin is really the source of all sin, why would there be this variegated sort of kaleidoscope of different things that men fall into in particular sins? An even more pressing question to me, John writes to us in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I believe that to be absolutely true. I know that all men who confess faith in Christ would. Clearly, man can be cleansed of his sins. So why wouldn't the child of two cleansed, sanctified, forgiven believers inherit their cleanliness instead of Adam's sin? Why would one be more hereditary than the other? Why would goodness not pass along through the same process? A final question as we just sort of begin. The scriptures are very clear that Jesus was a man. He was born of woman he was born with thoughts and feelings and emotions and physical limitations like all other men. Two of his genealogies are provided by Matthew and Luke. They track his ancestry, maybe through two diverging paths. They start at different points in time, certainly. One going all the way back to Adam, one only going to Abraham. Jesus was a human born into the world from a long line of humans born into the world. The Spirit takes great care to express in the fullest, most absolute terms possible the reality of Christ's humanity. Yet he was just as obviously, from the scriptural record, sinless. Rather than being entirely depraved, corrupt, and alienated from God, how can this be possible if sin and depravity is passed on through earthly ancestors? Would not Jesus have been stained by the same thing that plagued every other one of Adam's descendants, if this were true? Well, it is obviously the case that this idea, this position, was not just dreamed up one day. Someone had an apple fall on his head and said, I think man inherited Adam's sin, and I'm going to go with that. Obviously, some kind of proof is offered in support of total depravity or original sin. And again, our question is simply going to be then, does that stand up to scrutiny? 
We'll actually start with a a claim or a proof that isn't biblically based. We'll look at some passages in just a moment. But it's I've I've heard numerous times in my discussions with people that espouse this belief. You might have as well. And it might sound fairly convincing at first. The idea that proof of total depravity can be seen in the behavior of, of infants themselves, of very small children, who from a very early age frequently express all manner of things we would find to be sinful, especially their, their self-will, their selfishness. They get angry. They disobey their parents. They don't listen. You look at one of these small children and think, oh, look, he's, he's, he's very, very young. And this is his nature to go astray, to begin doing things that are, that are sinful, that are wrong. Maybe those babies aren't quite as innocent as people are making them out to be. In response, I might offer a problem or a question. For every baby who is ill-tempered and disobedient, haven't you met one who's sweet-natured and listens to their parents? And they're kind and they share and they're generous and they're sweet. And if you do so much as look at them wrong, they might apologize for whatever they've started doing. Probably, I, I grew up in a family with one of each, in fact. I won't, I'll won't. i leave you to figure out which one I was. Um, not the one I would prefer, but that is beside the point. You probably have a family where, yeah, one sibling or the other, or maybe you're, you've started a family where one sibling or the other is that way. One is very kind and sweet and they they share with their playmates they hug them they help them so forth and little brother is a hellion and everyone's terrified of him because the, his his wrath is just so unbelievable if there is anything done to upset him maybe all of this doctrinal dispute could have been avoided if one of John Calvin's kids hadn't been such a stinker, apparently. Maybe that, that was, they were just reformers walking around that had kids that were just awful. And so they thought, these, these people are all wicked. That's not serious, but in all seriousness, the point remains, if bad behavior by infants is used to prove total inherent depravity, we have to be fair and say that good behavior must be allowed to prove total inherent goodness. Because they do many things that are kind and sweet. In fact, though, if Being honest and looking at the very root of things, actual newborn infants, a truly firstborn baby, doesn't really do anything. They they don't really have any moral calculation in anything that they do. Have you seen a baby that is just freshly born? They eat, they sleep, they go to the bathroom, and they cry when they want your help with one of those things. That's all they do. And none of those activities have a moral component to them whatsoever. It's not good or bad to do any of those. That's what a newborn baby does. By the time a child is actually making decisions about their behavior, nature has surely been compromised by nurture. There's been the addition of influence and instruction. So it would be impossible to really say one way or another, he's this way because he's Adam's child. Maybe he's that way because he saw dad doing that. Maybe he does that because mom said that word. This is simply not going to prove anything, I don't believe. Well, let's look at some of the the passages that would be offered. And there's, first of all, a sort of family group of proof texts that are very similar, that that seem or that that are claimed to indicate a sinful state, a natural sinful state that is common to all men. And this is connected especially in Romans 5, as we'll see. I'll put a a verse from each of these, at least, up on the screen. It is thought to have come from Adam in in Romans chapter 5 is where the connection is made back to. So Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18, is Paul uh, really quoting at length from the Psalms, but bringing out all of those statements, there is none righteous, no, not one. All men, in, in Paul's estimation are not righteous before God. It is a state common to our race. Romans chapter 5, there in verse 12, through one man, and he's talking of Adam there, sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. Well, that might sound very much like he's saying, since 
since Adam sinned, we all die and there is sin on everyone's account, right? The 58th Psalm, David says the wicked, in verse 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they're born, speaking lies. The problem with this is that we have to pay attention to the common thread in each of those verses. Why is it that those things are so? In fact, in each of those passages, it will be explained. Another question we'll look at in just a moment is some of that language figurative in describing the state of certain men. I think in the case of Psalm 58, it certainly will be. But pay attention to that first question. Why is this? Paul says, there's none righteous. No, not one. Verse 10. What does verse 12 say? There's none who does good. Why is there none righteous? Why, why can't you find in the basic state of things a righteous man? The condition is not congenital. It's brought about by one's deeds. Paul writes throughout that passage, Paul or, or the psalmist, he is quoting. He talks about those who lie, those who curse, those who run on swift feet to shed blood, those who spread destruction and misery and discord. These things can't be said of anyone at birth. Because humans are born without the ability to speak intelligibly. A baby can't curse anyone. They can't say your name. We're not born with the ability to walk. We're not born with the ability to do any notable violence. How would those things be said as a natural state? There's none righteous because everyone sins himself. People do these things. The responsibility here is personal. And really this would be case for all of those. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, it is found right there in the verse that we began with. Through one man sin entered the world and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Every man ended up doing that same thing that Adam did in different ways, but the same disobedience to God. That's where the guilt comes from. That's where death derives from because all sin. The wicked, David says in Psalm 58, go astray. And they either do so or exhibit that they've done so by speaking lies. Again, here's someone who is wicked because he has made himself that way. Clearly, David is using highly figurative language. He's talking about just how wicked his enemies are. He's essentially saying they've been this way since the day they were born. It's, it's hyperbole. But furthermore, we might say if this doctrine of total depravity were correct, David would not say the wicked are estranged from the womb, as he has said there in verse 3. He would have to say all are estranged from the womb, wicked and righteous alike. And here is what some of those men end up doing. But this is not what David says. Wickedness or sinfulness is both of those passages, and all of those passages, and many like them, it's actually a result of simply sinning, no more and no less. A final text for our purposes, and I, I realize this morning, I did not give the caveat as I began. This is the quick version of things, of course. There is much more to be said on the topic. I am very happy to discuss, to study, to share notes, anything that you would like or that would enhance your study of the matter. Uh, but I'll look at one more final example for now. This morning, and that's from Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 3 in Ephesians 2. We'll find Paul making uh, the statement in verse 1. Uh, actually, I will put that on the screen in a moment. Uh, go ahead and, and turn to Ephesians 2 if you'd like, but we will look at it in a sec. He talks about you who were dead in trespasses and sins, but then uses the phrase to describe these people there by nature, children of wrath just as the others. And that phrase, by nature, is commonly pointed out, used to argue that Paul is saying that men are naturally, that is, by virtue of being born, we are children of wrath. Again, it, it does sort of sound that way, doesn't it, just in reading that. By nature, children of wrath. You can't avoid that. You're born into that. That's what you inherited. What is the problem with this? Again, if we investigate why they were dead in trespasses and sins, 
because they had trespasses and sins in which you once walked. That's how they ended up dead. They'd sinned against God. They had been disobedient because of how they once walked or once conducted themselves. Look at what he says there in those next three clauses. You were following the course of this world. You were following the prince of the power of the air. You were walking after a different master other than God. That landed you in death and sin. It says you, you all once lived in this way. You carried out the desires of the body and the mind. Why did they end up in that state? Those are all personal decisions. Those are mistakes made each individually. Let's then comment on what exactly that phrase means. So, so we're by nature children of wrath. Heirs of the wrath of God. People who would receive the wrath of God by nature. I do not think, nor do, do many scholars, actually I'm on both sides of this issue. I do not think that this refers to a state from birth but rather to something which had become nature. And we use that language all the time, in fact. The best example I have been able to think of myself, or the one I like using, is uh, think of a great athlete. Let's use LeBron James as an example, or pick your favorite basketball player, whatever it might be. Some, some top-notch, incredible, once-in-a-generation athlete in some sport. It's obvious if you've watched him play, LeBron James is an extraordinary basketball player. He's, he's incredible, even if you don't like him. And I really don't. I root, him, I root against him any time he plays my team. He's, I, I want the Dallas Mavericks to win. Sorry, Thunder fans. But we can all agree we don't like some people, right? No matter what you think of him, incredible player. You could say, and many have, he's a naturally great player. He has skills, he has abilities that are lent to, that are prone to making someone exceptional at basketball. Six foot eight or six foot nine with that grace and athleticism and speed and leaping ability and court vision and ball handling skill and all those kinds of things. You just say this person looks like they were made in a lab. They're naturally great at this sport. But do you think someone like that works out to improve his athleticism, his conditioning, his physical abilities? You think he spends hours at the gym shooting free throws? You think he does countless drills to, to work on that ball handling or post moves or you know ability to find teammates, whatever it might be? You think he studies footage of upcoming opponents to see if he can find tendencies to exploit? I'd say that a naturally great basketball player is going to do all of those things. You would say in some sense he has worked very hard to become a naturally great player. Additionally, while he might be a natural, you might look at him and say, boy, he's just, he does it so effortlessly. But if he had never picked up a ball for the first time, he wouldn't be a naturally great basketball player. He'd be a guy who'd never played basketball before in his life. If he had lived 300 years ago, nobody would say LeBron James is a naturally great basketball player because there was no basketball. The sentence wouldn't have made sense. Unless that happens, if he had only ever played tennis, he obviously never would have been that thing that we ascribe to his nature. So it was a part of his nature, but it was a part that he had to act upon to be of any effect whatsoever. Now, I believe those same things could be said of sinners. We all have inborn within us the potential to be sinners. The nature that lends itself towards falling into temptation, pursuing our own will, pursuing our own lusts, finding within the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, something that deters us, that pulls us away from serving God. That is our nature that might make us prone, susceptible to those things. Yet you will never be a sinner until you are a sinner, until you have actually fallen. And we might say further of that, that you can fall so far into evil that it becomes your nature, using the word to mean it's what you do first and best and without thinking 
Again, we refer to that oftentimes to pick up things that we, to, to talk about something we've picked up later in life. It just means that it's what comes easily to me. We are by nature children of wrath when we are without God. We sin readily. We sin easily. We sin happily. It's, it's second nature to us, we might say. Close our study just with a few final considerations. I want to wrap up by briefly considering a few passages from a, a positive perspective, not trying to disprove anything, but finding or trying to find what Scripture really says about our nature. What does the Bible say about sin and guilt? Who is really responsible? You don't have to look at all these I'm putting up there on the screen. Write them down and look at them later at your leisure if you'd like. But I've, I've listed several passages from just from the book of Acts um, that all illustrate people who make it very difficult to say that man is wholly defiled and made opposite to all good by simply being born. Again, that is the position of, of original sin, that just the moment you take your first breath, you are completely and entirely wicked unless God acts upon you particularly to do something else. However, look at the way these people are described throughout the book of Acts. The Jews on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and verse 5, they were devout men. The Ethiopian eunuch in chapter 8 was returning on his way from worshiping God. Cornelius in chapter 10 was a devout man and one who feared God. Lydia in chapter 16, also a worshiper of God. The Bereans of Acts chapter 16, probably the Berean Jews who met in the synagogue there. Luke says that they were fair-minded or that they were noble. Paul, as he describes himself down in chapter 22, even when he was doing wicked things, he says, yet he was zealous towards God. Look at any of those traits that I've listed there. Those are all very good things. Wouldn't you say that those are all qualities that a man should strive for, that they are things that are not wholly opposed to all good they're complimentary. They're godly. They show, that, they show something that the Lord would be pleased with. Every one of those statements is made of someone who is not yet a convert to Christ. Those are all said of people who were not yet in Christ. They are not Christians. They are not yet believers. These men and women in those passages were not wholly disposed to all evil with total inability to respond to the Lord. They were good people and noble people who had responsive hearts. And when they heard the gospel, they did so and appealed to God for his mercy and salvation. A second idea I take from two passages, Zechariah 12 and verse 1, and maybe especially from Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7. And if you read that verse, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7, there, there seems to be a distinction of sorts that is made. Both of these passages, Zechariah 12 is the same way, both of these passages simply refer to the soul or the spirit of man as something which is created by God within that man, something that is given to him by God. And I know you could say that of, of the physical form as well, I suppose. You could say, yeah, God creates everyone. Jeremiah talks about that, or the psalmist talks about that. You created me in my mother's womb, etc. But especially Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, look at the, the distinction he makes. The dust will return to the earth as it was. That's, that's the physical body. But the spirit will return to God who gave it. There's a difference there. That these are not made of the same raw stuff. These are not the same material that we're dealing with. There is a distinction between soul and body. It's set apart Something different from that dust that forms your physical flesh. The soul is not something that we can inherit. You can get a lot of things from your parents. Height, eye color, male pattern baldness, big teeth, gap teeth, buck teeth, all, all manner of things you might be able to blame or, or thank your parents for. Beth and I kind of joke around with the kids sometimes. We've, we've each got little clones. Um, if you've seen my baby pictures or if you knew me when I was little, Malcolm is the second coming. And I, I, I kind of, you know, I'll hold him up sometimes and joke with him. 
you look cute now, but this is your future. I mean, <laughs> make your peace with it. And Bonnie, you know, hit the jackpot. She'll look a lot like Beth probably when she grows up. But, yeah, you can look at a, a person and say, this is probably what the kids are going to look like. They got those things genetically. They got those things through the natural process of birth and heredity. Sin is a spiritual disorder. It is not something that affects the body. It defiles the spirit. How would it be passed down like physical characteristics if God forms the soul in this way that seems distinct and separate from the human body? A third idea. Brother Buchanan read for us from Ezekiel chapter 18. And we find in verse 20, I think the whole passage illuminates the issue, but in verse 20 especially, the soul who sins shall die. The soul who inherits Adam's sin shall die. The, the soul who is, is born and just by virtue of that it will die. No. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. If the son does not bear the guilt of the father, how could the son possibly bear the guilt of an ancestor from hundreds of generations ago? Or does God hold each man personally accountable, as we've said? I want to close looking at these three passages here. Again, just sort of a verse each, but ones that I think within them make a compelling point, and many more scriptures could be added to these. Just chose these three sort of from memory, knowing that this language was used, but it's found over and over again throughout the scripture. They all point out that man is guilty, that man is in need of salvation for his own sins. Matthew 1 and verse 21, when the, the wonderful news is proclaimed that Messiah is coming to the earth, that to you a son will be born, Jesus. And what will he do? What will Jesus, Yeshua, the, the Savior, what will he do? He will save his people from Adam's sins. No, that isn't what it said. He will save his people from their sins. Because men will do wicked things. They will fall short. They will find themselves guilty before God. But they will come to Jesus and he will save them from that. Romans chapter 2 and verse 6, where Paul is discussing our God and, and the judgment process. The Lord will render to each one according to Adam's deeds. No, that isn't what it says. He will render to each one according to his deeds. God will look upon your life, your decisions, your faithfulness or lack of it, your righteousness or lack of it, your confidence in Christ or lack of it. And that is what you will be judged according to. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, as really the invitation is being given in that sermon. Repent therefore and be converted, that Adam's sins may be blotted out. Oh, that isn't what it says again. Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Because the Lord wants to save you. Personal accountability is the rule throughout the Bible. Are we born in Sin. Is this what we have to worry about? I would say no. We don't need to concern ourselves with the guilt of those who have come before us any more than those who are still living. We're concerned for their souls and we want them to likewise be saved. Other than that, their guilt matters not a whit for you or for me. I'm very glad I didn't ask Ed to read verse 32. Of Ezekiel 18. But he added the final verse of the chapter. In reading from Ezekiel 18. That really restates. What the prophet wrote in verse 23. I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies. Says the Lord God. Therefore turn and live. It is the will of God. That all men would come to him. Because as Paul told us in Romans 5. All have sinned. I have done it. I have fallen short of the glory of God. You, if you can listen and understand what I'm saying, 
You have the ability to reason out right from wrong. You've done the same. It is those sins that God wants to save you from. Because he has no pleasure whatsoever that one would be lost. That one would be severed from him eternally. This is the great news that we find in the gospel of Christ. That salvation is available to all. This morning, if you would avail yourself of it, we must stress again that idea of personal accountability. I suppose it's, it's good on the one hand, you're not guilty of someone else's sins, but neither can you be saved by someone else's good deeds, by someone else's righteousness, by someone else's obedience to God, unless we are talking of Christ himself, who made the payment for all to be saved. Appeal to him. Come to him in faith. Come to him in obedience. Come to him calling upon his name. You will find his grace. You will find his mercy. You will find salvation from your sins. If you would this morning, repent and be baptized. Be converted to Christ. We stand ready to assist in that. Come forward.